Great. Thank you very much. Hi, whoever's out there. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mark Ward. I'm sitting in Ankara in Turkey. Um, and wherever you are, I wish you well. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my, my career. And my, my talk is, is, I titled it, When Humanitarian Principles <clears throat> Meet the Real World. And my focus is going to be principally on Syria and Afghanistan both of which were big features of my career. Um, I've been involved in humanitarian responses after natural and man-made disasters for the US government, for the United Nations, and for a large humanitarian organization. Um, pretty unique uh, resume. Um, examples of disasters that I've worked on include the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, the earthquakes in Pakistan, Nepal, and China, uh, rocket attacks on Lebanon in 2006, Syria's civil war. Um, I was involved uh, from about 2012 to 16 or 17, and then Afghanistan off and on for decades. And now I'm trying to be retired. Um, if we're gonna talk about humanitarian principles, uh, it's probably important that I start with telling you what are the humanitarian principles. Uh, there are four, and they're pretty basic, and I'll quickly go through them. Um, the first is the principle of humanity, which means that human suffering has to be addressed wherever it is. Then is the principle of neutrality, which is very simple. Humanitarian organizations should never take sides in hostilities if the humanitarian crisis is caused by a conflict. The third principle is impartiality. And that basically says that humanitarian aid should be provided on the basis of need alone, regardless of who is in need, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what they believe, regardless of any of those issues. People in need are the priority. And then finally is the principle of independence, which says simply that we should try to keep politics out of a humanitarian response. Now, those are the principles. <clears throat> they sound pretty great, right? I mean, who can't support or even applaud them? We Americans would say that's like mom and apple pie stuff. Um, I'm sure if, you, if I asked you to raise your hand, you'd all agree that these are principles um, that anybody could, could live with um, after a disaster, man-made or natural. And humanitarian principles are really, really priceless when they work. Um, we relied on them regularly over the last years to deliver humanitarian aid in the eastern provinces of Afghanistan before the Taliban took over. And I'll give you an example. So the organization that I was in charge of in Afghanistan was providing medical services in those Eastern provinces between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And very often we would have a static trauma center. So, you know, a, a, a permanent building, a structure. And the question was, where do we put it? Do we put it closer to the Taliban side or closer to the government side? And remember those principles of impartiality and neutrality. Uh, we don't pick sides. Um, and this became a very, very difficult issue because when there's a civil war underway, uh, trauma happens and people on both sides, particularly fighters on both sides, needed our, our services. And what we found over the years is that by... Um, not only espousing, but living the principles of neutrality and partiality, we were able to convince both the government and the Taliban that no matter where that trauma center was located, they would have access to it, that we would, we would never turn anyone away. We didn't care which side they were on and where, whichever side of the conflict you know, was sort of uh, holding that area where our clinic was, we insisted that they allow access without asking who the person is or how they got injured. And because we were able to live up to those promises and honor those principles, 
um, the Taliban and the government really came to respect us and basically leave us alone when we would decide where to put these clinics because they knew that we would insist that everyone get access no matter which side they were on. That's just one example of how the humanitarian principles can really help you to do work <clears throat> in a war zone. But sometimes, and this is what we're gonna talk about today, humanitarian principles create problems on the ground in a conflict. So maybe you know the word squirming. I'm gonna make you squirm today. My first example to get you squirming is from the Syria conflict. So I worked on the Syrian Turkish border uh, for about five years. And then in Geneva, I worked with the UN and our good friends, the Russians, to try to improve humanitarian access for the people in need inside Syria. And I'm gonna talk in particular right now about food aid. So the Syrian regime, the government in Damascus, sadly, was starving communities that supported the opposition into surrender. We could reach a lot of these besieged communities cross border from Turkey or Jordan, but not all of them. Some of the communities were deep inside the country. They were cut off by the regime and the UN wouldn't deliver or try to deliver food to them without permission from the government in Damascus. And that's where the problem arose. The government wouldn't give the UN permission and therefore there was no access to a lot of these communities. And this was their strategy for putting down the opposition, starve those people into submission. And sadly, it was pretty effective. But with pressure from the international community and mostly <clears throat> from the Russians to allow more humanitarian aid into the area, the regime, the government in Damascus offered a solution. They said, look, you, the UN, if you'll provide food to several communities that are not under siege, communities that are loyal to us, the government, um, then we'll let you have access from time to time to a besieged community or two. In other words, the regime was saying, feed people that aren't starving, who support us, and we'll let you feed people once in a while who don't support us and desperately need the food. And without consulting with any of the donor countries that were paying for the food and assumed that the food was going to people in need, the UN agreed to this deal. And the practical effect of it was, to put it in blunt terms, that the regime could spend less money feeding its people because the UN was doing it for them and more on barrel bombs. Now the US, that was me, when we figured out what was going on, we complained to the UN and we even reduced their funding to send a strong message. So here's, here's the question, did we do the right thing? Or should we have just looked the other way and ignored the humanitarian principles to save some lives in those besieged areas? What would you have done? Stick with the humanitarian principles and only allow food to be delivered to people in need? The risk was that if we did that, the regime would continue to deny the UN permission and people would have starved to death. Or would you forget the principles for a minute to ensure that food was getting to those who needed it most, at least occasionally, but risk more abuses down the road of the principles by the regime because they could see that we really didn't stick with them all the time? What would you have done? So while you're squirming, I hope, in your seats about that dilemma in Syria, let me describe the clash between the humanitarian principles and reality in Afghanistan today. I was just there 
last week. So as you know, Afghanistan is facing a serious humanitarian crisis, terrible economy, a terrible winter, and the lasting impact of COVID on public health. Now the good news, which doesn't get reported very well, is that the humanitarian community that's provided humanitarian aid across Afghanistan for decades is still there and is well-funded by the donor countries, including the US. I ran a large humanitarian organization in Afghanistan for two years, and I still visit the country. And nearly all the big humanitarian organizations kept going when the government fell, and they continue to operate today. But they're facing a grave crisis. The Taliban's supreme leaders in Kandahar have banned Afghan women from working for humanitarian NGOs. They say it's because Afghan women are not observing um, their decrees about modesty in their attire. You know, are they adequately covered? Are they wearing the right hijab? Um, or are they ignoring this? But rather than pursue the few organizations that might not be complying with their concerns about attire, they banned all Afghan women from working for all humanitarian organizations. Kind of makes you wonder what's really behind the decree, but that's a topic for another presentation. So you may ask, what's the big deal? Why couldn't the humanitarian organizations just hire more men to carry out their important work until the modesty issue, the, the, the dress issue gets resolved? Or why not replace Afghan female staff with international female staff? Because the decree only applies to Afghan women. Well, Afghanistan, as you may know, is a very conservative Muslim country and male workers would not be allowed uh, by any local communities to engage with females living there. Females need female doctors and other medical personnel. Males cannot distribute food to females who are not their relatives, and on and on. And international women would not be trusted and it would not be safe in these rural communities. In short, the only way to deliver humanitarian aid to Afghan women is with Afghan women from that area. So the practical effect of the Taliban banning female workers from humanitarian organizations is to keep humanitarian away, aid away from half the population, women, many of whom were in desperate and are in desperate need. Well, the humanitarian organizations working in Afghanistan reacted swiftly. They said that their male employees would not work either then to protest the new regime's decree. Now, some UN agencies disagreed and looked for ways to continue to deliver humanitarian aid without female staff, but other UN agencies who rely on the humanitarian organizations to carry out their work had no choice. The, this boycott was in place. The humanitarian organization's hope was that surely the communities would pressure the Taliban to relent and allow women, females to return to work when they saw how the decree was harming women in need. But three months on, the harm is visible across the country and the, degree, the decree remains. In addition, high-level delegations from across the humanitarian world, Islamic scholars, leaders of other Islamic states, traveled urgently to Kandahar and to Kabul to meet with the Taliban leadership to try to find a solution. Leaders around the world, including our Secretary of State and the UN Secretary General, condemned the decree and its impact on needy females. But so far, all outside attempts to convince the Taliban leadership to back off have failed. Now, some limited ex exceptions have been granted to humanitarian organizations working in the health sector, but they've also added on additional restrictions on their work that make it very, very hard for them to operate. The bottom line today 
is that a country with some of the greatest humanitarian needs in the world is getting only a fraction of the help it needs because the humanitarian organizations have been effectively forced to ignore the needs of females. Once again, humanitarian pr principles are clashing with the real world. The Taliban seem unconcerned about the needs of females in their country. And the humanitarian and UN agencies are trying to figure out how long to keep the male staff away too before the human cost becomes too great. What would you do? Are you squirming? Would you end the boycott, send your male staff back to work to help as many people as you could? Of course, this approach would send a signal to the Taliban that the humanitarian community is not really serious about these humanitarian principles they espouse and could lead to pressure to violate even more principles. For example, what if the Taliban demanded that all humanitarian aid had to be distributed through their offices and by their staff? They'd love to get the credit for food and medical needs across the country. Or what if the Taliban demanded that the humanitarian organizations hire their former fighters, qualified or not? They'd love to find employment for thousands of former fighters, young men. These are very real concerns of the humanitarian organizations working in Afghanistan today. Or would you continue the boycott and tell your male staff to stay home indefinitely? Would you stand behind the principles, even if it means that some people in need, the men and the children, could be helped now, but won't be? Have I got you squirming again? A few minutes ago, I asked you to raise your hand and say that you would apply the humanitarian principles to all man-made or natural disasters. Would you still raise your hand? Even if you could save lives today by looking the other way sometimes? Tough questions. I teach graduate students about international conflicts part-time at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I always tell my students that if you think the answer to a question I've posed is black or white, then you haven't understood the question. And it means they just haven't studied it enough. Squirming and gray answers are the norm when it comes to humanitarian aid and humanitarian principles. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the humanitarian principles. It's much easier to deliver humanitarian aid in the world today because of them. I, I started out by telling you how they helped us site trauma clinics in Eastern Afghanistan in the middle of a war. When the humanitarian organizations stand behind those principles in unity, they can be very strong. But I hope I've given you a sense today that sometimes they aren't omnipotent in the face of a government or a regime that doesn't seem to care about the needs of their people. Some would say the principles do harm. At what point should we put saving some lives over principles? I've been dealing with this issue for years. Look at me, and I'm still squirming. Thank you very much. That was a very complex and very uh, powerful look at how the very complicated ethics of providing humanitarian aid. Thank you so much, Mark. We really appreciate that. Um, do we want to do questions at the end or would you like to take questions now? I, I think it would be most appropriate to do them at the end. That's my vote. Perfect. Okay. I just want to double check with everybody. Okay, okay. great. So we are going to pass the program off over to Donald S. Travis right now. And his talk is why the U.S. military lost Afghanistan. Um, Mark, or, or, I'm sorry, Donald, are you uh, ready to present? I am ready. Wonderful. I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Um, and we look. Thank you.
I want to thank Mark Ward for that excellent presentation where he uh, discussed uh, the current conditions in Afghanistan. So my presentation is going to focus on um, uh, the actual title, Why the U.S. Military Lost Afghanistan. So I'm going to go ahead and before I really get into the meat of the presentation, um, and this should be working, Christopher. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's not advancing right now, so. Um, sure, it might get, it might be stuck for some reason. Okay. Um, you may also wish to do either screen share so the panelists who are viewing this remotely can see, or if whoever's doing the video, if they can tilt it over so we can see the screen in person, whatever option that the staff on site wish to do is perfectly fine yes. with us. And we'll do screen share and now I have control. So can you see it now? Wonderful. Okay. Um, we only see a video of uh, you currently, we don't see the screen share. Okay, he's working on the screen share Okay, perfect. Now. Thank okay. you. Uh, please let us know when you see it. Um, I currently do, I only see the live video at this moment. Okay, okay. Oh. We're good, wonderful. Okay, we're good. Also, I wanna thank the Policy Studies uh, Organization for inviting uh, me to come here to talk about uh, this issue of the US military in Afghanistan. And before I launch into this particular issue right here, and again, it's not advancing, Christopher. Sure, it was working a second ago. Okay, I just wanted to uh, kind of introduce myself and put this topic in perspective. So this particular uh, bit of research on Afghanistan and the U.S. military was published in an uh, article form in the, um, the publication Armed Forces and Society. Um, and so this can be uh, accessed, uh, as, as you see here at, at this web page. So uh, I want to let you know, though, as a disclaimer, that about five months after this article was published in Armed Forces and Society, I was hired as managing editor of Armed Forces and Society. I had already had uh, a relationship with the journal for about six years as a reviewer and member of the board of editors and so on. And so my hiring uh, was not connected to this publication. This was uh, my fourth article that was published since 2016. So also, I do want to say that this article uh, that I'm about to describe, this work that I'm about to present today, does not, does not reflect the views of armed forces and society or the inter-university seminar on armed forces and society, which is the uh, organization that that actually funds and oversees armed forces and society. My background, of course, I started as an infantry officer, uh, was commissioned, 31 total years of service. And so you can actually see on the screen, you know, some of the places that I've been. I have been deployed uh, in a number of places around the Middle East for 30 day, 35 day deployments, uh, more than a dozen over a few years. And also, I was a strategic planner at U.S. Central Command, uh, which oversees the Middle East um, and manages the Middle East as far as a conflict. And also, I was an Afghan planner uh, involved in the Afghan retrograde operations in 2012. Again, it is not advancing. Okay, so this is actually the journal, and I, I do want to just say that Armed Forces and Society, I do encourage anyone, if you do research in any of these topics, uh, that you may want to consider submitting to our journal um, at, at our webpage, which is in the upper left. Uh, Armed Forces and Society is a leading peer-reviewed interdisciplinary international journal. When we deal with security, we look at all the limited wars, we look at peacekeeping operations, counterterrorism, and the editor-in-chief currently is uh, 
Dr. Per Patricia Shields of Texas State University. And she's been the editor there for more than 20 years. So now uh, let's get into the meat of the uh, presentation. What you see here is a picture of um, Afghan National Army cadets at the Afghan National Defense University in Kabul on May 7th, 2013. And the picture, of course, shows uh, a number of motivated young officers ready to be deployed out to defend their country. Uh, and so um, this being the, the, the opening, I also want to say that currently, as we are, as I am talking and as I'm presenting, there is a congressional review of Afghanistan going on in the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, so I invite anyone, you know, to maybe tap into that and see what's going on. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and move forward and remind some of my viewers uh, just uh, for less than 30 seconds that uh, there was a U.S. Taliban peace agreement uh, that was uh, brought into force or signed in February of 2020. Then, of course, the fall of Kabul, uh, August 15th of 2021, going on uh, very soon. It'll be two years. And, of course, this evacuation that happened, which uh, seemed to be somewhat of a traumatic experience for the American people during the August month of August in 2021. So the overarching themes in my article and in my research here is that uh, the U.S. military is, has a problem, what I believe is a problem. That is, there's a prevailing belief in the U.S. military establishment that is the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, that all wars or all conflicts can be won with superior firepower and force. And uh, secondly, about the last third of uh, my article addresses ideas, of, presents ideas of Professor Morris Janowitz, who offers an alternative way of waging wars based on the tenets of philosophical pragmatism. So, uh, when we look at this idea of this U.S., this prevailing belief in the U.S. military, which actually uh, took hold and has dominated U.S. military policy since 1945, you're dealing mainly with roles and missions of U.S. armed forces, that is the Army, Navy, Air Force. And of course, uh, you know, these are, these are the prevailing beliefs of the careerist bureaucracy uh, being led by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, and what I call the Tribal Confederation of Agencies and Defense Corporations that run U.S. military policy. So I have two research questions that open this up. Uh, first is, um, uh, I wanted to re-examine again after the several years that I spent planning and strategizing with Afghanistan, is what kind of war did the U.S. forces wage in Afghanistan? And secondly, how and why did Afghanistan collapse so quickly and completely? So when we look at these, why did the U.S. military lose Afghanistan? It was uh, is my, my belief, uh, based on my research, uh, that Afghanistan was lost because the U.S. military employed conventional strategies and tactics while mismanaging resources. There are a number of narratives promoted by the U.S. military, mainly the Pentagon, that attempt to explain why the Afghan government collapsed so quickly to the Taliban. And you have these counterterrorism strategies focused on killing uh, throughout the entire time we were there, from 2002 to 2021. Uh, and I, I assert that it was de facto strategy of attrition the idea of uh, what, what I believe is a bankrupt strategy that was employed during the Vietnam War. And also the Afghan army and police were poorly trained and equipped. Uh, the training uh, by NATO countries, mainly the United States and other contractors, they were going through the motions of training and not really training the way they should be training forces that were fighting uh, an insurgency or a guerrilla uh, force, namely the Taliban and other, other criminal organizations. And finally, there was this failure to employ what I, what I would call the constabulatory type forces. There were no skills, no capacity, lack of capabilities. And I'm going to describe constabulary practices in just a few minutes. And so 
during this time of being in Afghanistan, what the U.S. military actually needed to do was to do things differently to develop a viable Afghan army and police force so that we could have attempted to develop a society somehow or support the development of a society that would respect the rights of women, that would respect uh, the rights of all people uh, in Afghanistan. So, so these, these failures and these problems re reflect a fixation by the U.S. establishment on conventional war fighting, okay? And of course, um, along with that, the Afghan National Army and police were overly dependent on US airstrikes and NATO Air Force and airstrikes. Finally, uh, the best weapons were not given to the Afghan National Army for a number of reasons. Mainly, the Afghan National Army never developed a system of accountability. And um, there was not enough what's called special forces. These issues will be revisited in just a minute. So in looking at um, through more than 20, maybe 30 uh, news articles uh, across the spectrum, mainly through the United States, uh, we come up with a number of what I call the Pentagon's lost cause narratives. So uh, I, I, I liken this lost cause type of narrative to the lost cause narrative of the Old South during the American Civil War, where the South uh, claimed that they knew that it was a lost cause, but it was a noble cause. It was a worthy effort. And down here at the bottom right, I say, you know, the effort to build a modern Afghanistan was a noble effort worthy of an attempt. However, the Pentagon's lost cause narratives, the Pentagon explained uh, through uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and other leaders in the Pentagon that um, the Pentagon badly misjudged the Afghan military's will to fight leading up to 2021. The senior ranks of the Afghan government and military were deeply corrupt and they were poor leaders. The frequent and unexplained rotations of Afghan senior commanders undermined their fighting effectiveness. The local Afghan leaders struck secret deals with the Taliban that undermined the Afghan government. Now I'll go down a little bit. The Taliban further, the Taliban failed to fully honor their commitments made under the February 2020 peace agreement. Here's one that came out in the New York Times. The president. Ashraf Ghani, unexpected departure from Afghanistan hours before the collapse of Kabul, and so on. These are all arguments offered by the pundits, that is the opinion leaders, arguments offered by military leaders and politicians, uh, uh, ex excusing and explaining why uh, the country fell so fast. Most of these arguments were used in the 1960s and 70s to explain why South Vietnam fell to the north. These same arguments made for the failure of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s. So why did the Afghan army and government collapse? There was poor development in security institutions. And two reasons, main reasons for the failure, as I, as I write in, in the article, is that there was emphasis on a conventional warfighting approach, counterterrorism operations. U.S. forces and NATO forces put a lot of effort in search and destroy, trying to find uh, the enemy, trying to find the Taliban and anyone else, any malign group of, of forces that might undermined the government of Afghanistan and Kabul. They went even and went after ISIS uh, forces and so on. Missile and combat airstrikes, what's called kinetic operations. The goal was to kill enough Taliban fighters to achieve victory through a strategy of attrition. And secondly, the substandard training and development of the Afghan army and police that evolved over 20 years of US engagement their development, the development of the Afghan army soldiers and leaders was not a high enough priority for the Pentagon. The Pentagon 
uh, its primary and top priority was always to prepare for the big war, to always have forces ready to fight the big conventional battle against the next hegemon challenger on the global scale. Afghan was a second, third tier effort. Also, there was the overuse of combat air support by the Afghan National Army and by the police and by US forces supporting them. Over dependence on US missile strikes and Air Force bombing sorties. And also, of course, uh, overly Afghanistan was overly dependent on US training and NATO training overly dependent on all the weapons and the ammunition, the food and water, that Afghanistan would not uh, be able to continue to fight for even a week without sustained U.S., European, NATO support. But I think one thing that really needs to be emphasized here, and as I think about it more, it's most important, is that the vulnerability of the families of Afghan service members to guerrilla war tactic, tactics of intimidation assassination, abductions, bombings, and so on. When Afghan soldiers went out to the field and conducted operations, their families or extended families were identified and they were harassed, in some cases abducted, killed, and so on. And then of course, this inability to develop national level institutions and a rule of law. All of this, all of this that I just described was well known and predicted by strategists, soldiers, leaders, planners in the US defense establishment. There were hundreds, probably thousands of Air Force strategists, Army strategists that fully understood that, that these were systemic and deep problems. And so uh, I, I think that when we look at all of this, uh, I, I can say with some confidence that based on how quickly everything fell apart, the Afghan people were misled and they were deceived by NATO and U.S. forces. A case in point is briefed on June 23, 2010. The Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, was briefed on what's called an intermediate military objective. And that objective was in part a majority of Afghan National Army battalions function and operate autonomously of US NATO support. This, was re this particular objective in 2010 was reviewed and endorsed by the senior leadership, senior military leadership in the Pentagon. Robert Gates uh, stated that it will be interesting to see how we assess this objective and how far we can go to achieve it. So some questions here is what does function and operate independently mean so that we can assess? So the senior leadership even knew of these systemic problems. So let's uh, look at Janowitz. Why Janowitz continues to be relevant in the 21st century. His recognition that nuclear weapons altered or changed warfare where wars, wars would be limited wars. Well, Ukraine will probably remain a limited war, the, the current war going on in Ukraine. Therefore, Alternative war fighting strategies and tactics were required to defeat various, various types of different kinds of enemies. He came up with something called the constabulary concept. When joined with force and coercion involved strategies based on a police concept. Talk about these various tasks, forensics, investigations, protection, accountability, counter-corruption. These skill sets are enduring according to Janowitz. They needed to be institutionalized in the US military and to transfer to the Afghan government and forces. So if we, if we really look at these with some more um, detail, to win limited wars, military forces must carry out these police tasks and duties of forensics, investigations, protection, accountability, counter-corruption. Uh, over on the right, you see the list here of various countries. Janowitz was not saying that the United States military or military should get involved necessarily in law enforcement. However, when you're standing up a military, a military needs to do a little bit more than hunt and kill or destroy and track down and 
commit strategy of attrition. Military needs other skill sets, additional skill sets. So I introduced Bernard Fall. He was a professor at Howard University. And so when we look at some of his quotes, Bernard Fall, he said that it is hard to win a propaganda battle in which we have musical chair generals. Well, the United States military rotated commanders in and out of Afghanistan every two to three years. Major General Flynn came out in 2010. He said that 90% of the weapons being used in the, uh, by the Viet Cong are captured American, American weapons. It's related to that particular uh, quote. Major General Flynn said in Afghanistan in 2010 that the Taliban can sustain itself indefinitely at, at relatively much lower cost. And that is a clear parallel to the quote here on uh, Viet Cong and weapons. And so Bernard Fall had a, a, another quote that's interesting that was published in U.S. News, Re News and World Report. You want to put it down in one single sentence, you know what is wrong with Vietnam? You, you want to know what's wrong with Afghanistan? There's no punishment for failure and there's not enough incentive for doing well. That is what is wrong with Vietnam. That's what is wrong with Afghanistan. And of course, I share a couple of uh, quotes from Robert Gates from some of his writings and some of his statements. So we now, uh, I'm coming close to uh, a, um, a closing here. We have, uh, you know, currently we're, we're dealing with the Ukrainian war, a limited war for Russia, a total war for Ukraine. So then, then you know, the question here is, could a constabulatory military or skills, constabulatory skills, be useful in Ukraine to fight corruption and so on, to ensure accountability of Stinger missiles and other types of weapon systems that the uh, US and NATO are providing to Ukraine. So Afghanistan war issues and ambiguities. Of course, the US military maintains its faith in conventional war fighting. There's no change in how the US military uh, develops its roles and missions. Okay. Senior leaders attempt to implement change, but often they get pushed back by the system. Question is, did the U.S. NATO really want to establish a viable Afghan army and police? And, and if the U.S. and NATO did, in fact, establish a viable standalone army and police along with the government, what were the implications of that? Did we understand that? Has the Pentagon really learned anything from Afghanistan? I, I took this quote, uh, this idea from Alistair Stark from a publication in 2019. He's, he calls it institutional amnesia and crisis management analysis, uh, an organization's inability to recall and use historical knowledge for present day purposes. Afghanistan is the forgotten war. It is a forgotten war. Uh, when Ukraine flared up in February of 22, it seems as if we don't hear much about Afghanistan. And that's why I really think that Mark Ward's presentation on uh, the current conditions in Afghanistan is, is so important that that kind of information is what belongs in our colleges and universities. And we need to to, to teach uh, students of international relations the importance of what happens when wars do fail. If for the US military, there is really no change in how it does business. And so that concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. Wonderful, thank you so much for that breakdown of what had uh, led to the government uh, collapse in Afghanistan in August of 2021. Very insightful um, and really appreciated the look at other historians and philosophers on that topic. Um, so we're going to have a question and answer period. So for all the panel, for all the um, participants, 
feel free to put your uh, questions in the uh, webinar chat and Zoom, or you're welcome to go on the Whova app and add your questions there. Um, we do have a couple questions from the audience. This first question is for Mark, and it says, can you discuss a bit how you got into the field of humanitarian efforts? How do you even begin to prepare to handle these challenging ethical questions? Ha! Huh. Uh, if you dye your hair white and get old and wise. Um, no, I, I, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, all my students in Seattle um, ask me the same thing. Um, you know, when I first joined the Foreign Service a million years ago, um, I remember Abraham Lincoln was president. I remember his hat. Um, I had no idea I'd end up being like the conflict, the disaster guy. Um, I started out as a lawyer in the Foreign Service. How much more boring could that be? Um, and, you know, as my career evolved, I saw opportunities present themselves um, that were perhaps a little more risky um, than other assignments and not a whole lot of people volunteering to give them a go. And something about me and, you know, everybody's different, um, made me comfortable working in a conflict environment. Um, whether it was man-made or a natural kind of a disaster. Um, and I, after a while, I just sort of got a reputation as somebody that the State Department and USAID could rely on and the UN could rely on in a really tough um, uh, environment. You know, so I've worked in, like, I, I was in Libya um, when the United Nations first went in there, even before Omar Qadda uh, Muammar Gaddafi was killed. Um, you know, I've in, been in Afghanistan more times than I can count, you know, working in and around the Syrian border um, during that conflict. Um, I, I, I can't tell you what I did to prepare for it, but I think the only thing I can tell you is it's in your gut that if you um, can handle this kind of work. And what I always tell my students uh, is, if anything that I've done interests you, um, the best way to test whether you could do it is to start now and do some volunteer work with people in need in your own communities. Wherever you live in the United States, there are homeless. Wherever you live in the United States, particularly these days, there are probably refugees or there are you know, drug abusers. They need help. But it's not easy work. Try it out. See how you feel in your gut. And if, if it doesn't scare you away, and, and for some of you it will, and that doesn't mean you're a bad person. That just means this kind of work isn't for you. But the, for those of you that, that um, like me, are comfortable working in that environment, <laughs> um, you've that you've learned something very important. And then I think perhaps pursue this as a career. Um, but test it out first in your own backyard. I think that's the best advice I could give. Thank you so much. That was extremely insightful and also very practical, which is uh, sometimes rare to get. Um, okay, we have another question, and this one is for Donald. Um, it says, we have a body of work on the failures in Vietnam and now the failures in Afghanistan. How can these lessons be best applied to future conflicts? Uh, it's also a two-part question. Second part says, and do you have thoughts to share on the Ukraine slash Russia conflict? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the best way that we can try to apply our lessons from past wars uh, into the future is we need to uh, basically do two things. Uh, first of all, um, we need uh, our, our defense establishment, our top leadership in the defense establishment and the Pentagon need to acknowledge that preparing for the next big war, global hegemonic World War II style war is not the top priority. That's number one. Okay. And then secondly, uh, 
number one feeds the second the second part. The second part is that there needs to be a refocus and a reorientation on the careerism in the U.S. military, the careerism in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Space Command, Cyber Command, and so on, when officers and non-commissioned officers uh, decide to make a lifetime career of the military. And what I mean is that promotions and assignments should be based on preparing for actions and conflicts and activities related to our future wars, the next Afghanistan and the next Vietnam, and not not some whimsical war that's going to happen 30 years into the future. Until we do those two things, we will never, never apply the lessons learned of Vietnam or Afghanistan. As far as Ukraine, as far as Ukraine and the, the, the war, uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, and my perspective, uh, I do not subscribe to everything that I read uh, in our media about what's going on in, in Ukraine. Because uh, I think uh, Mark even mentioned that in, in civil wars, trauma happens. Mark, I believe you said that. Um, in, in all wars and, and in all conflicts and all wars, uh, there are often no good guys and no bad guys. So uh, what, I, what I would share with the person asking the question and with the audience is that don't just accept the information that's being handed to you by our, the main media remain a little skeptical about who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much for your in insight on that. Um, I currently do not see any more questions, but I do see several thank yous. So thank you so much for your presentations and sharing all your insight, your knowledge, and your thoughts on this, on what, you know, what's going on in Afghanistan and also uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Um, do you have I have a question. Sure. I mean, if it's open, I have a question for Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Mark, uh, in your four principles, you, humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Um, I think that like humanity probably surrounds all four in a way, you know, it's kind of that driver. With independence, you mentioned keeping politics out of a humanitarian response. But um, I would like to ask you about that. Uh, yeah, that, that idea is somewhat ambiguous because it is a political act also to provide humanitarian assistance. I was wondering if you could parse that out or debunk what I'm trying to say. So. Yeah, I mean, I used to run the disaster bureau at USAID. And so I know very well from experience um, how our own domestic political issues um, can influence our response. I wouldn't say that it will keep us from providing humanitarian aid, but what's going on in the world at that particular time can certainly influence how much humanitarian aid we provide and how long we provide it, um, and how important that country is to our foreign policy at that particular time. Um, and this is something I struggled with because, you know, I was trying to be the champion of humanitarian principles within the US government and argue that, um, just like the principles say, it shouldn't matter who the person is or who the people in need are or where they are, what should matter is the greatest need gets the greatest help. It doesn't work that way. Um, and, you know, if a country, I mean, first of all, the country has to ask for the help. And so when there is, for example, um, I don't want to get political here, but if there were, for example, an earthquake in North Korea, um, they're not going to ask for our help. 
ditto Iran. Years ago, there was a terrible forest fire in Russia. I think this was during um, either the Yeltsin years or the early Putin years. They did ask for our help, or we offered and they accepted that we sent US Forest Service experts over there to give them advice on fighting the forest fire. Um, but if a country doesn't want our help, we don't go. Um, if the country does want our help, and it is a country that is very important to us at the time, uh, we'll provide a lot of help. If it's a country that asks for our help and is an ally of the United States, there will be help. Um, but, it, but again, it will depend on how much help and for how long. There will be a number of factors. One, obviously, is the extent of the need, but also um, how important that country is to us. Um, so I, I, without um, naming names and naming countries, which uh, gets uh, um, difficult, uh, I think I'll leave it at that, but it absolutely happens. And, and let, me, let me go a little bit further maybe and get a little bit closer to Donald's world. Um, what is the intersection between humanitarian organizations and the US military look like on the ground uh, after a disaster hits? For example, right here in Turkey, I'm in Turkey right now. I was here checking out, working with some organizations on the earthquake response. The principle of independence is difficult to sustain if a humanitarian organization is arriving on a US Air Force helicopter. The US Air Force will offer the helicopter. Why do they offer the helicopter? Because they care. They're, they're good people. They want to help. And lift is often very, very important, particularly if there's been an earthquake, because the roads are cut or the airport is cut. And a helicopter is great because it can usually take off uh, and land you know, in very, very little space. But how does it look to the other side in a conflict, if it is a conflict? Here, it was a natural disaster. But how would it look if the humanitarian organization that I was leading in Afghanistan arrived in a village in uh, Eastern Afghanistan on a NATO helicopter? What message does that send to the Taliban about our neutrality and impartiality? Shoots it in the foot. And so very often we had a bit of tension in the US government between the humanitarian agencies and the US military who again, were just trying to help um, to, to politely say, guys, you know, we're not gonna ask for your help because your gray tails, your Air Force helicopters um, you know, are one side in the conflict and we can't be associated with that. Thanks. I just wanted to quickly just follow up and say, um, I'm a political scientist. I've taught the political science 101 course on three different college campuses over the last 28 years, whatever, teaching concepts and so on. And when the military says that it is apolitical, it's not true. It can't be. Um, so I just want to submit to you, um, when you say keep politics out of the humanitarian response, I, I, I would offer that you, you, you may want to amend that to say keep partisanship out of humanitarian response and keeping partisanship, whether it's, you know, Republicans and Democrats in the United States or partisanship on the ground in uh, Niger, you know, three warring factions don't don't subscribe to it. remain neutral. But saying keeping politics out of it, politics is so uh, overarching and such a loaded word that it's impossible to keep. So I, I conceptually speaking, I just wanted to address that. That's Thank you for the feedback. These are the UN's principles, not mine. Um, yeah, it's, it's their language, but well, point well taken. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions at this time. I do see many thanks for this uh, talk. So I just wanted to thank you so much both to, to both of you for this uh, incredible look at not just the issues only in Afghanistan, but around the world and the 
uh, very complex ethics and optics and uh, histories, uh, political ideologies and so forth that go into this. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And we hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye, thank you.